A key to understanding course materials is what we call active learning. Active learning means both effective study habits and intellectual involvement. Elisa stresses both aspects as she guides her students in organizing their time. But she's going to go over lo looking last first. Okay, so she's a, a lecture behind. Try to stay up with the lectures. Um, okay. The thing is, you, you can go to a lecture and take notes on a book you haven't read. But the thing is that you're not really hearing um, as well the points that she wants to bring up as if you've already read it. Mm -hmm. See, if you're already familiar with the material, you can go back and go, oh, yeah. You also have room to make objections in. You know, you have the room to say, well, gee, that, that's, that's weird. How can she say that? And then you can bring up your hand and say, well, I saw it as ta da ta da ta da And you can come here and do the same thing, you see. So it is, a, it is very important. Also, there's a hell of a lot of reading. So, you know, if, if you can keep up with the pace that she has set down, then you will finish the reading by the end of the quarter. In previous quarters, I've had people trying to read three or four novels in the last week. And I don't want that to happen to any of you. It's just too painful. Effective learning requires the right time and place. Ask your students how they manage their time and choose their study environments and help them work out any problems. People learn only what they understand. You can increase understanding by encouraging active learning and by providing meaningful context to which students can relate new information. Surveying the course with students is one way of establishing context. Here you can discuss the syllabus, exam schedule, course concepts, and vocabulary. Sometimes even the course title itself needs defining. I've made a list of some important concepts that you should be getting out of the class so far. And these are what we're going to talk about uh, today, and we're going to be doing examples on some of these. All of these words should look familiar to you, <laughs> all, right? all these phrases. But the reason why I put physics up here is that I find that most people, including graduate students, right, really don't know what physics is. So what, you know, what do you think physics is? What do you think it is that you've been spending so much of your time you know, beating your head against a wall trying to understand? Mm, it's just the uh, study of, um, I guess, matter and energy and the uh, various phenomena associated with it. Right. That's that's a description of thing. Can you can you think of a more fundamental idea about what physics is? Can you probably haven't thought about it before, so it's unfair of me to ask. But well, I mean, physics is, in a, I think, in a way, study of almost everything physical. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think you basically got it. Physics is the study <clears throat> in the most fundamental way possible are the fundamental laws upon which all of objective reality, everything that we observe, is based. All right, so it's the most fundamental of all sciences. It doesn't mean it's the best of all the sciences. Now that this student grasps the purpose of physics, the other concepts on the list may fall into place. Another way to establish a context is to find familiar categories or hierarchies into which new information can be classified. At first, Chris's students can't tell a conditioned stimulus from a smoker's cough. What, now is this top part right here? You see, I would be the fear of shock. So then the unconditioned stimulus would have to be the shock. shock. They are just guessing. No. <laughs> Why don't we start from the beginning on this one? Next. Okay. okay. The best way, remember, we have two questions to ask yourself. Uh, two questions to ask yourselves. Number one, is it a stimulus or is it a response? And the second question is, is it a conditioned or is it unconditioned? Okay. Chris points out familiar categories implicit in the new concepts and suggests a sorting process. Verbal thinking is only one learning mode. Visualizing and even acting ideas out physically may be the most direct ways of mastering some material. They have to have 
spatial ability, but to be able to visualize things. Because I've found that the best approach to chemistry is to I my, my I use this phrase over and over again, you know, what's actually happening. Try to put things in physical terms, which is very difficult with chemistry because you're dealing with atoms and molecules and you can't you can't see them. Um, but if you were to, to visualize what's happening on a molecular level, then it becomes easier. I usually use a piece of paper and I draw a little box that has that represents what's go, what's going on. I ask myself, okay, where does this oxygen go? Where, 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 where it goes into both both of those compounds, H two O and the CO two. Okay, it goes into both of these, but um, okay. So where now I switch it around? Where does this oxygen come from? Come from either of those two. Okay, it can come from either of these two. So in other words, if you if you calculated the amount of oxygen in here, you couldn't use that to find out how many moles of oxygen were in here because it has another source. Mike guides this kinesiology student in the process of learning by visualizing. Absolutely. Okay. Planaris. Plantaris? Plantaris. Latin. <laughs> it ain't there. Uh, lateral. Wait a minute. I can't see it here. Good. Take your time and visualize it. Okay, visualizing it. What's Can I it say Plantaris was that little one? No. What's it going to do? Plantaris is the one that wasn't that, that developed in, in people, that it, it was in would, caps yeah. for springing. Okay, so what's it going to be involved with? Jumping. To do that, what's it going to be involved with? Well, jumping, but. Well, you got to flex the knee. Okay, so what's it? It's going to flex the knee here. Flex the knee, and a plantar flexes your ankle then. Okay, but where's the attachments if it's involved around through here? It's underneath there someplace. Where? It's, well, I, all I can see is my hands moving okay, the leg around but, to pick it up. But, okay, but what bone then? Starting with that. It was over the femur. Okay. I had to attach to, uh, on the, oh, on the lateral side, the lateral surface of the femoral condyle, I guess. Outstanding. Well, super, super condyle. So, oh, the super, oh, okay. Okay. super condylar lines. But, okay, but you see how we're going around deducting it? Straight memorization is like, wait, well, the bones? Oh, wait a minute, it's got to be on this side. And you can see it, you start figuring out what it does. You can see attachments. Mike's coaching focuses on the process of visualizing, not the answer to his question. Once the students can visualize, they have the answer and also a way to recall it. But recall doesn't always just happen. Making and reviewing lecture and reading notes is probably the most common way students prepare to recall. Check your students' notes to be sure that they're hearing, selecting, and organizing effectively. You write very well. Get rid of my chicken scrawl. Oh, this is very nice. One thing I recommend is maybe draw a little bit bigger diagrams. So other than that, it's very nice. Excellent job. Done good. Done good. <laughs> Learning complex material takes time. Regular recall practice, not all night cram sessions, increases both learning and confidence. Assignments such as making flashcards help students master course material and learning techniques at the same time. Because it's going to be too difficult to learn it the night before. Writing down flashcards beforehand forces you to learn it as you go. You can't make flashcards and summarize those concepts unless you understand them. Definitely, I'm going to ask you guys again, to see next week I want to see your flashcards and I want to see that you've done them because I think they are a good study guide. There's, this test is probably going to be even harder than the other one because of all the mathematical relationships and the curves and it's going to be very, very impossible to study the night before and be able to do well. Mnemonic devices such as humorous associations are good ways to back up logical connections. Now we set a price floor for cotton at $500. Is the price floor below or above equilibrium? Above. Okay. okay. Why is that? Because you can't go under a floor. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's silly, but it'll make you remember it, okay? Um, Don't hesitate to share your own tricks for remembering. Students master course material by making it understandable. Mastering exams requires the same effort to understand and be understood. First, 
the students must read the questions carefully to understand what the professor is asking. Chris helps his students practice strategies for reading multiple choice questions. Now you're going to be scanning is using the information available to you. You're going to check over all the different alternatives. Okay, so you're going to read A, you're going to read B, you're going to read C, and D without making any judgments. You're just going to scan them or look over all the, all the alternatives. Now you're going to use what strategy after this? The concept. No, no the focusing You're going to use strategy. focusing. You're going to focus in on one of the right answers. Which one? Condition the condition stimulus. Because condition stimulus meets your global hypothesis because you've scanned all your answers. By the way, that's why people miss multiple choice um, test questions. They make a global hypothesis, they read A, they don't scan the rest of the answers. A looks good, so they put A in there without looking at the rest of the answers. Reading the question carefully is, of course, essential in essay exams as well. Time spent on planning the answer is time saved in writing. Well, see, the thing is, you guys are going to have two hours, yeah. uh, sorry, three hours to do two questions on the next one, which means that you've got an hour and a half to write one question, or say an hour and okay. 20 minutes. So you can afford to spend 40 minutes outlining it. Because if you can get that good an outline together, that you know exactly what you're going to say, and you know exactly what your arguments are, exactly what your proof is, you have no doubt about what the thesis is, I mean, you know, that then you can just write quite yeah. easily and pay attention to style, pay attention to grammar, things like that. If I can get my thesis statements and I'm okay. Well, also evidence, because um, I remember from the, um, well, not from your exam actually, but from your practice question, I remember you had a very good thesis and then the examples were, you know, not strong enough or to I, support. Or I was missing a few. Not well, they sides. just weren't the strongest examples, that's all. The most important key to successful exam taking is staying in control. No matter how well your students have prepared, they may still need strategies to quiet self-doubt and to coach themselves to the success they deserve. But that's just my personal advice, is to, is to keep it in perspective, that this is what, is it 25% of your grade, this mm -hmm. test? Yes. Okay, this test is 25% of your grade. Okay, it's 30 questions, okay? You take each question one at a time, you don't get panicked about the time that's left, and you do the best you can. And if you can walk out of a test saying, I gave it my best shot, that's about all that you can expect. And if you know that you've done all the work up until now, which I think you guys have, if you've read everything, you've come to tutoring, you've participated, and you know, all, yeah, you know all your equations and graphs, there's, you know, don't kill yourself saying, <laughs> I could have done more, you know, because it, you've probably done the best that you can. And if you can feel good about that, then, <laughs> then you still have tonight. <laughs> okay? But eat breakfast, too. Seriously. In this tape, we've suggested ways you can guide students in that active effort to understand that leads to real learning. First, you should encourage active learning, which includes managing study time and environment effectively. By helping students establish context, Surveying the course and classifying new information, you can show them how to make course material more meaningful and thus learnable. In many subjects, visualizing is as important a learning mode as verbalizing. If you demonstrate recall techniques, such as note-taking, practicing recall through flashcards, and mnemonics, your students can learn course content and study methods at the same time. Like course mastery, mastering exams requires the effort to make meaning. Students need strategies for understanding questions and planning understandable answers. Finally, no matter how well your students have prepared, they still may need tips for staying in control at the exam.